So, so I am Lenny Wong. I am a researcher at the Army War College. And uh, what that means is they have a little a group of about 10 of us, and Don Snyder's one of them, that are, uh, they don't trust us to get near the students. And so they, they put us off in a little institute, and uh, they tell us to write stuff and uh, think things. And so that's, that's my job. And uh, so I knocked out this study a little over a year ago. Um, but really, the study started almost a decade before. And uh, that study started back when the chief of staff of the Army uh, came to the Army War College, and he said, I'm going to give you a tasker. I need to improve innovation, everything we're talking about just a second ago, uh, creativity, uh, I need to develop initiative in our junior officers. And, uh, and he says, I don't think our culture is supporting that. And I think a uh, critical developmental experience where they're not developing that is company command, five to seven years into the Army when they're commanding their first large formation, 150 people, we're not allowing them to do anything. We're telling them too much to do. And uh, he said, the way we're gonna solve that is that we're gonna divide what we tell them to do into two categories, mission essential and non-mission essential. So mission essential is things like the range. It's things like maintenance. Non-mission essential is things like? What? What? Uh, you have the questions and feedback occur now. Oh, don't wait till the end, okay? Because by the time it gets to the end, my mind is empty. I won't answer a single question, okay? So um, when I ask a question, you have to answer it, okay? So because really, I'm not going to ask. I won't ask questions at the end, okay? So or you won't ask questions at the end. Um, so like, what's non-mission essential? See, ten years ago, if I would have asked that question, what do you think people would have said? No. In an army audience, if I would have said, like, what's non-mission essential training, they would have said sexual harassment. No one says that anymore. OK. But what else is like non-mission essential training that is mandatory? IT. OK. What else? Motorcycle safety. We had a new one just put on us called Constitution Day. Does anyone here, does anyone know what I'm talking about on that one? You, you, you know what I'm talking about. A mandatory training class on Constitution Day. I said, what in the world is that? We have a new one called fetal alcohol syndrome. Okay, human trafficking, dangers of the USB drive. Anyone in the Army know what I'm talking about? <laughs> really, okay. Um, it's all that stuff. And so the chief said, I want you to take all that non-mission essential stuff, cut it in half, and give all that back back to the company commanders on their training calendar, allow them to develop, plan, resource, and execute, and evaluate their own training. So we don't have to tell them what to do. So we did that. They gave me 10 war college students. Instead of writing their strategic research paper, their thesis, they took on being part of the task force. I sent them around the world to collect up every single requirement put on company commanders. They got over big time because they didn't have to write a paper. And like I sent three of them to Korea, I said, get me every single requirement from division down to brigade level or down to battalion level. They spent a day doing that, a day golfing and a day shopping. Um, but they got it done, OK? Um, uh, and so we took all, that, all those requirements together, and we said, OK, base it out of a 10-hour day in the Army. They work 10-hour days. And so um, that was supposed to be a joke. But anyway, uh, <laughs> so we said 10-hour days, and this is what we reported back to the chief. We said, uh, chief. Company commanders somehow have to fit 297 days of mandatory requirements into 256 available training days. Uh, now, in the RC, the reserve component, how many training days do they have? 39. And one of them is the picnic and the PT test. OK, so they have to cram all those days into that, OK? And so it's chief, we can't do it. And even if we cut the 36 days of non-mission essential training in half, and we give them back 18, it still doesn't do anything. Because it's, you can blame it all you want, like we used to blame it on the non-mission essential stuff, all the little piddly stuff. It's not that. It's that we have this culture in our profession where we love to think of things for someone else to do. We tell them how to do it, and then when they try to do it, we disrupt it with new taskings. That's our culture, Chief. And so I put that out in a study over a decade ago called Stifling Innovation that we have to let up on all these requirements. So that was over a decade ago. And, uh, but always in the back of my mind after I did that study was, well, wait a minute. If it's physically impossible to do all the mandatory things that we're told to do, what do we report? 
Well, you know what we report because there's only one thing you're allowed to report, and that is we are green. We're green. We're good to go. Okay. So then how could that be? If it's, if, so I said, you know what I'm going to do is I'm going to go check into that. And uh, a colleague of mine, Steve Garris, and I decided to work on this. And I said, uh, the way I'll figure this out is I'll approach uh, I'm very officer-centric on this study. And so I said, I'll talk to officers throughout the Army. So I started at Fort Benning, Georgia, where we have our infantry and armor captains, uh, our O3s. And I said, I'll collect them in focus groups. I went to Fort Lee, Virginia, where we have our logistics captains, talk to them in focus groups. I went to the Fort Leavenworth, where we have our majors, like here, and talk to them in focus groups. I went to the Army War College, where we had former 05 commanders, talk to them, former 06 commanders, talk to them. And I went to the Department of the Army, where I talked to staff officers and some civilians. And I would start talking about, what do you think of all the requirements we put on people? That's always a great discussion question for Army people, because you, know, you just get, oh, can you believe this one? And then we got this one going on, and this is ridiculous. It's, it's impossible to, to do everything. And, and it's really fun complaining together with Army people. Um, and then, so we really get the energy going in the discussion. And then all of a sudden, I'd say, so if, you, if it's impossible, like we all agree to do it all, what did you guys report? And the discussion would just drop. It would just drop, absolute silence in the room. Because what I was doing was calling them liars. And you don't do that to an army officer. Because army officers have this identity that they see themselves as bearers of integrity, as, as someone who knows what honesty is. And how does that self-identity come? Well, first of all, society tells us that we are above everyone else. Um, if you look at the Harris poll, where they ask which leaders of which institutions do you trust in the United States, military leaders always rank at the top. 55% of Americans say they trust the leaders of the military institution. I used to think 55% isn't the greatest percentage, but it's the highest. But when you contrast it to Wall Street and Congress at 6 and 7%, we're pretty good up there. Okay. Now, I also say we. I'm a retired geezer. I'm really not part of the profession, but I've learned that when I talk about this topic, it sounds a lot better if I say we, instead of you are a bunch of liars, I can say we are a bunch of liars too, so, so I say we. Okay, so first of all, we tell ourselves, society says we're above reproach, but we also tell ourselves that. If you look at 93% of army uh, officers, when they're surveyed, say that their personal values line up with the Army values, the Army values of loyalty, duty, respect, integrity, and all that stuff. And so, so not only does society tell us, well, you guys, you guys are honest people. You're, you're above all this. We tell ourselves that. And so when some guy from Carlisle Barracks, Pennsylvania, walks in and says, nah, so you guys are lying? That doesn't sit well. That doesn't sit well at all. And so I keep pushing it. And uh, I'd get responses. Um, from things like, uh, well, first they'd start saying things like this. Nobody was ever asked to report something as true that was not. Or I've never given a false report. Never intentionally have I said, yes, we're 100% on this when I knew we weren't. So they just pushed it right back at me saying, you don't, I don't lie. But then I'd push it even more. And then I'd get comments like, well, we got creative. You got to make priorities. We met the intent. And then finally they started using words like, hand-waving, massaging, checking the box, or fudging. And after about 20 minutes of me hammering, someone would put their head in their hands and say, OK, fine, we lied. And then after that, we started having a different conversation. Uh, but it wasn't up until that point that, that we could actually have the conversation. And so we focused on mandatory training. And uh, we started talking about. So how do you deal with all this mandatory training? Well, a, lot, a big example for a lot of officers was right before a deployment, uh, they would put everyone on block leave. And then uh, after the block leave, they'd come back and they have about a month before they deploy. Who's in the Army? Raise your hand. Oh, man, a lot of people. OK, if you don't know what I'm talking about, ask one of these interpreters to tell you what I'm talking about. OK, so, um, so right during that month period, Right before deployment, they would cram in all the mandatory requirements that they have to be done as fast as, as, fast as they could. And so one way of dealing with that um, is from an officer told me this is the way they took care of it. They would pick the smartest dude, and he would go and take it nine times for the other members of his squad. And then that way, they had a certificate to prove they had completed it. 
So they just collect up the CACs and start cranking out the online training and do that. And so, so that's just an example. Another example is before this study got uh, published, I sent it off to a, an 05 that I knew, a friend, and I said, you know, just look this over. And so he's sitting at his desk reading it, and uh, as he's sitting at his desk, he sends this back to me in an email. Um, he writes back to me and says, uh, as he's sitting at his desk, his NCOIC slides a roster underneath him with a pen and just says, just, just sign this, sign this, and slides it back. And uh, <laughs> because in the other room, what was going on? Training. Mandatory training. And he was reading a report about lying, and uh, he just <laughs> signed it, okay? And so he stopped his NCO and said, you're not going to believe what I'm reading. We need to have a talk. And so he thought it was really interesting that that, that occurred. Um, and so, so mandatory training happens like that. It's, it, it happens on uh, rosters that, that are filled out by somebody else. It happens on, uh, on briefing that everyone got the suicide prevention training. When you know there was someone in the hospital, you know there was someone in jail, you know there was someone on leave, uh, but it, uh, still reported 100%. The problem with talking about mandatory training, though, is, is that we have a tendency to focus just on mandatory training or just on this non-mission essential stuff because it's easy to talk about that. Uh, the question is, does it happen in other places? Well, does it even happen downrange? Does it happen in a war situation? Maybe this is all just the bureaucratic things of taking care of business. And so I talk about what happens downrange. And so, for example, uh, a lot of officers talked about when they turned in what is that? Storyboard. A storyboard. That's not a real storyboard because real storyboards are secret, and, I, and so this is a fake one, okay? Storyboards. After every event that happens on a combat outpost or a, uh, someplace else or on a patrol, they have to say what happened, describe it, pictures, PowerPoint, and uh, to t give a narrative back up so they could use it for future operations or for a picture of situational awareness. People said, you know what? Storyboards are a pain in the neck. We don't know where they go. They just disappear into the ether. We don't know. And so what they would do is they'd either fabricate them, they'd cut and paste old ones in, but they wouldn't tell the truth on storyboards. Uh, or a battalion commander says, you know, uh, right before the elections, they told us to check security at uh, 150 polling sites in Iraq, which is a good idea, but I can't cover 150 polling sites. But they said, you have to cover 150 polling sites. Give us the Excel, Excel spreadsheet on what happened. We gave them what they wanted, okay? Clearly saying, or it could be that SERP money. You know what SERP money is? Okay, uh, that was supposed to be going into service projects in the local village. Well, we needed hot showers, and so we used the SERP money, and so, yeah, we had to fudge a little, okay? And so it's not just mandatory training, all the non-mission essential stuff uh, that we talk about that we like to poke fun at, but you know what? It really goes beyond that. and. Uh, and it sort of surrounds us. But it's not just training requirements either. Sometimes it's the administrative things. For example, people in the Army might know what this is, but does anyone in the Army, not in the Army, know what that is? Do you guys have, this is something called TRIPS. Okay? And what TRIPS is, well, see, back in the old days, when I used to go on leave, I turned in what form, people in the Army? A Department of the Army Form 31, a leave request. And that's all I turned in. Now you have to turn in your Department of the Army 31 and you have to turn in your TRIPS report. So you go on the computer, and it's a travel risk planning system, okay? And you go in there, and you say, I'm going to drive to Indianapolis. It's going to take me eight hours. Um, I'll do it by, by driving straight with the radio on, the window down, and three monsters beside me, okay? And that's the way I'm going to get there. And TRIPS will say, no, rejected, too much risk. So then I go back, and I say, Okay, I'll stop every two hours, I'll spend the night here, and I'll drive with my mother-in-law. And then it'll say, <laughs> Trips will say, green, you're good to go. You submit that in with your, your form. And as an army, what we've learned is you tell Trips what it wants to hear if you want to go on leave. Okay? And in addition to the Trips that you have to turn in, you have to turn in vehicle inspection, a leave form, your LES, your f tickets if you're going, going to fly someplace, and some units you have to turn in a soldier covenant saying, I am a good citizen. Oh, yeah, and med pros, okay, <laughs> mandatory training, all that stuff. Now, all you want to do is go on leave, and now I turn in all this stuff, okay, and what you find out is 
there's a lot of lying going on with this, okay? So it's not just training. It's not just training. Is anyone, are we tracking? Okay, if I'm speaking a total foreign language, just if I'm speaking too fast, um, slow me down too, okay? So we go from mandatory training, not just the dopey stuff, but important things. We go to administrative things, but we also go to things that in the Army we don't even think about. That is an officer evaluation report or a fitness report. Now, there's a lot of fiction written in fitness reports, you've got to admit, but I don't want to talk about that. What I want to talk about is how in the Army we turn them in. In the Army, the way we have to turn them in is that before a rating period starts, we have to sit down with the rated person and say, let's go over your objectives. That's called the initial counseling. And then what's supposed to happen after the initial counseling? Quarterly counseling. Now, a lot of people are very proud that they do the initial counseling. I can guarantee you that very, very, very few people do the quarterly counseling. But after every time one of these is due, you have to accompany your rating with this little support form that says when the counseling was done, and you'll take the support form, you go to the clerk, or else you go to the sergeant major, and you'll say, here is the support form supporting that evaluation. And they'll look down and say, I see you did the initial counseling, where's the quarterly counseling? And you'll say, well, I didn't do it, we were too busy. Um, he was deployed, I wasn't, or something like that. And the clerk or the sergeant major will say, I want dates in there. And you'll say, I didn't do it. And the sergeant major or the clerk will say, I want dates. So they won't accept it. Right. So they'll walk over here in the other room, and they'll sit there, and they will agonize. They will agonize and spend time thinking about what? What dates to put in, because which, what don't you want to do? You don't want to put a weekend down, because then they will know that it was a lie. Is this true? Yeah, you know it. So they sit over there and get, oh, what date? No, you can't say that. It's a Monday. A lot of people don't work, not, to pick a Tuesday, right? Some people say it's got to be Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, because Fridays, all right, go ahead. Oh, okay, then you, then you get out of the calendars, okay? And so everyone's putting down all these across the Army. Tens of thousands of these are filled out, and people are making up fake dates, and everyone knows it, but what goes right beside that fake date? Your initials. your initials. And how much thought goes into your initials? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. But the initials... Who can, but the initials, your signature, right? It's, it's totally gone. It's totally gone. That's the culture we have. That that's, when I started this study, I said, we have to have these little research meetings, and, and we sit around and say, I think I'm going to do a study on this. And I brought this up, and uh, one of the 06s in our little institute says, I don't know what you're talking about. I said, I, I think we're forced to lie. And he says, I've never lied my entire 28 years. And I said, well, what do you call that support form? I just, he says, that wasn't lying. That was protecting my boss. See, it's not a lie. And so that's what we have to ask ourselves. How can we convince ourselves, not just the fact that we do that, okay, that, put that aside, but how do we convince ourselves that even if we do that, it's still not lying? Because remember, I spent 20 minutes trying to convince people that, you know, I think you lie. And, no, I don't. No, I don't. How do we convince ourselves that that's not lying? Signing a roster, putting our initials down. Well, what happens is something called ethical fading. Ethical fading is when we take that black and white of right and wrong, the ethical spotlight of this is an ethical dilemma, the fact that you've got the entire profession waiting for you to say yes or no, are you going to lie? No, we don't make it that. What we do is we fade it out. We remove that spotlight. This is not an ethical dilemma. This is not a moral decision. This is, this is business. This is trying to get the form turned in. This is trying to placate FRC. This is trying to protect my boss. It's not a moral decision anymore. So that's what we do, because that allows our brains, that allows our, our minds to sit easy with that professional identity I was talking about, and the fact that we're now putting down our initials, or putting down our digital signature, or putting it down a, a fake roster. I just gave a talk last week at our uh, Judd Advocate General School at Charlottesville, and uh, we have these uh, E9s that were in the audience. And the one guy said, because uh, I was asking for examples, and he said, my first sergeant in my last unit got us all in. We had an inspection coming, and uh, we had to do all the mandatory training, get all the records ready. And so he had all the rosters laid out on the table. 
and he said he had different colored pens, and we knocked out a year's worth of training in about 15 minutes. And they, they filled every single roster for every single piece of training in 15 minutes for the whole year. But we don't think it's lying. See, that's the thing. We don't think it's lying. How does, it get, how does an institution convince us, how do we convince ourselves that we're not lying? How do we ethically fade? Well, one way you ethically fade is you don't use the word lie. You use the word prioritize, or you use the word checking the box, or giving them what they want. Or one of the best thing is, one of the best euphemisms that I heard is when I said, don't you think that's lying? That's not lying, that's good leadership. Okay, so you change the words. It's not lying anymore, it's good leadership. Um, another thing, another way to ethically fade a moral decision on the institution's behalf is go ahead and numb us. Numb us to death, okay, by constantly asking us to comply, by constantly asking us to verify. And so for people in the Army, this is 1,800 words, and at the end of it it says, I have read and understand the above requirements concerning use of Army access systems. This is the information assurance thing that I think everyone in DOD has to sign. Okay, every year, I would be perfectly happy if it just said, I agree, okay? But this doesn't say that. This says, I have read and understand. Now, have you signed that? Did you really read it? No, you didn't, okay? <laughs> Unless you like, like to stick pencils in your head or something like that. Okay, in England, they were offering public Wi-Fi, and they were doing a little experiment to see how to offer public Wi-Fi, because it's really popular in Europe. And they uh, opened it up, public Wi-Fi access, except they had a splash page. You had to go to the splash page, and then you had to agree to the conditions. And the first condition on the public Wi-Fi was, I agree to give my firstborn uh, to use public Wi-Fi. How many people do you think agreed to that? Every single person. They had to shut the experiment down, because they, they said, we're getting out of control here. Okay, why? Because we're numb. We, are n we will willy-nilly throw our signatures down, throw our word down, throw our initials down, because we've been numb to it. Because the institution sees that it could use it easily. Go ahead and digitally sign this. Hand me your CAC, okay? Um, so, use euphemisms. Numb it, okay? Another way to allow us to lie without calling it a lie is to increase the distance to the dishonesty. I know that if I walked up to any of you and I asked you a question, you would tell me the truth, looking eye to eye. But if I hand you a CAC, I know that, ooh, this is almost easy, okay? So, for people in the Army, if you want to clear post, you're PCSing and you're leaving, and the little old lady in white tennis shoes says, so, have you been briefed on the sponsorship program? Get out the CAC, digitally sign it. Of course I have, that's what they do, okay? All you do is digitally sign that form, and she gives you a pass, you're allowed to leave post. If you want to tell the truth, who knows how long the sponsorship program briefing is. I've never seen anyone get briefed on the sponsorship program. All she wants to know is, have you been briefed on the sponsorship program? Okay, the CAC allows us some distance. We don't have to look at her in the eyes and say yes, okay? Um, and so, also briefings. And so when the briefing says suicide pre prevention training all, it's easier for us to point to green on a slide than to look someone in the eyes and say, yeah, 100% of my people, 100% of my people got that training when everyone knows, there's no way you got 100% of your people in that training, okay? But the green on a briefing slide allows us that distance to say, well, I'm briefing the green, I'm not really briefing facts that might relate back to me. So, use euphemisms, numb us, increase the distance to the dishonesty, but sometimes there are decisions that we know deep down inside, there's no way around it, we're sort of telling a lie. And so instead of ethical fading, what we have to shift to is rationalization. We have to come up with a reason why the lie is justified. And in the Army, the biggest reason why lies are justified is because a lot of things in the Army are dumb. And if it's stupid, it deserves to be lied to. <laughs> in this case, we almost think there's justice. We're, we, are, we are the champions of justice because the Army comes up with so many stupid things that this one, we're gonna balance the weights, the scales of justice, and lie on this one, okay? And so, for example, one captain told me, well, you can ask anybody in this room the purpose of declaring a troops in contact, a casual evacuation. We definitely know why we do that stuff and why we're re reporting. And people jump. They're timely, they're accurate. But then he adds, but some of this stuff is, you need this for why? Show me in the reports guide that we use that this is actually a required report. Because right now, 
it seems like you're just wasting a unit leader's time. If it's a dumb requirement, it deserves to be lied to. I have some people say, you know what, when a green tabber, that's if someone in a leadership position, a commander, asks me a question, they'll get the truth. If the staff asks me, 70%, we'll try someplace around there. Um, if it's a dumb requirement, okay, and we, the problem is we get a lot of dumb requirements. Anyone sitting behind a, a, a terminal can send an email with a request for information to just constantly sucking information. That deserves to be lied to, according to the culture we've created. Okay? But if the requirement isn't just dumb, we have to think of another reason why we might make that decision. And another reason why we might make a decision to lie is we, we tell ourselves it wasn't for personal gain. It wasn't for us. It was for the mission. It was for the troops. And so this quote comes from a Marine that was in a, uh, one of those forums that I was, uh, focus groups that I was telling you about. And he pointed out, here's an ex his example of that. An IED had gone off. They were having a relief in place. Two lieutenants injured by the IED. And he says, I falsified the TBI report that changed the distance from the IED strike to where one person was standing. So that way someone didn't come back down and stick a finger in my CO's chest and say, you need to evac that lieutenant right now. If I do that, I'm going to put my boys in bags because they don't have any leadership. That ain't happening. I owe the parents of this country more than that. So he knows he told a lie. But he says, it wasn't for me. It was for the boys in the platoon because I didn't want them to evac both lieutenants. And so that's why I told a lie. Okay. So we ethically fade or else we rationalize. That's the way we deal with it. But then the big question becomes, so what? So what? Who cares if this is the way the Army is? Maybe it's always been this way. I mean, you hear stories about Vietnam and all the ethical problems back then. Maybe when you walk into the supply room and you notice all this stuff in there, and you turn to the supply sergeant and you say, where did all this stuff come from? The answer should be, what? What's the typical answer when you walk in there and say, where, where'd all this stuff come from? Don't ask. Don't ask. Maybe that's, that's the way it should be, okay? Um, but we have to ask ourselves some questions. Has anything changed over time? Has the Army changed at all? Well, the number of requirements in the Army has... Does it ever go down? No. We, all we do is keep adding requirements on. It's a cumulative effect. Okay, we, it's really hard. We're like compulsive hoarders. We just like to keep pulling them in and putting them in. And someone says, well, what was this? And we say, I can't remember anymore, but we're not getting rid of it. We just keep it there. And we just keep adding more and more on, OK? The other thing is, is technology has changed. With the CAC, it's easy to reach down and say, I want 100% compliance in this. And with the CAC, I can do it. And I asked my, uh, I got a son who's an O3 uh, in the Army. And I said, you know, so how's it? He says, what they do is they collect up CACs. Give me your CACs. OK, good. And they just crank it and then do that. Because I was, I was going to talk about DTS. And he says, I, I've never done DTS. And I said, well, how do you go on TDY? How do you, or TAD, whatever you call it, how do you do it? And he says, I just hand my CAC over to somebody. And I go, oh, I didn't know that's, that's a new one. OK. But the CAC allows us uh, to get that distance. And the introduction of technology allows us to send requests for information, to validate it, to certify it. So things in the Army have changed. But there's five reasons I want to cover why the status quo, we can't let it happen. Why the status quo, we can't let it happen. The first reason is, is if we leave things the way they are, every individual gets to make their own decision what's right and wrong. So for example, when I say, well, I heard a lot of reports about people just making up storyboards, some people sit there and say, you got to be kidding me. You lie on a storyboard? That's intelligence. I mean, people's lives are at stake on a storyboard. And you had people saying they lied on them? Where I have other people saying, yeah, we just made up storyboards because you, know, you want me to spend you know, 20 minutes working on a storyboard or getting ready for the next patrol? Every individual gets to decide what's the limit. Where can I draw the line? And so when I talk about negligent discharges, some people say that's when you come back from an operation, you put your rifle in the barrel, and you pull the trigger, and it goes off. And you say, whoops. OK, some people say, well, as long as it's an honest mistake, the guy's not a dirtbag, you don't need a giant investigation. Other people say, that's a breach of discipline. That, that's a reflection of bad leadership, and it needs to be taken care of. Okay? Every individual gets to make their own decision on what's right and wrong. 
if we leave things the way they are. The other reason is if we leave things the way they are, everything becomes suspect. What can you trust? So when our chief goes, gets called before Congress and they say, how many sexual assault response coordinators do you have in the Army because you got a problem with sexual assault? And he gives them a number, and then he comes back, and he talks to his staff, and his staff says, well, chief, you know, that number really wasn't the right number because they asked for it, but we only had 24 hours to get the number, and so we sent the request out, and people gave us all these numbers back, but we just discovered the numbers really aren't the greatest. Well, what can you trust? What can you trust? You see, I asked everyone on the, on the, the, in the force about all this information they send upwards, and I asked them how truthful it was, and they said, well, it's really not that truthful. But I also went to the Department of the Ar Army, and I asked them, so, you know, here in the Pentagon, all this information comes up here. What do you guys think of that information? Do you believe it? And they said, no, we don't believe it. I said, why don't you believe it? And their response was, what's that? We've been there. We used to be down there. We know how impossible it is. We would never let a senior decision maker make a policy based off of that stuff. We know it's a good try. We know they're well intended, but we know it's not true. So then you have to sit back and say, okay, let's see. We're all making up stuff and giving it up there. They, we know it's a lie. They get it all. They know it's a lie. And yet the system keeps going. We keep going on with the system. And everyone just pretends. And so we have this mutually agreed deception going on. And we all play in this facade of everything's truthful. Everything's green. Everything's fine. Everything's 100%. Wow, what kind of profession is that where everything becomes suspect? So everyone gets to decide on their own what's right and wrong. Everything becomes suspect. Another problem is, is that it hides careerism. As we downsize the Army, nobody wants to be left alone on the island. And so we'll have a command and staff meeting, and they'll say, okay, let's brief human trafficking. A company, 100%. B company, 100%. C company is not going to tell the truth and say 78%. Okay? And so what... If we leave things the way they are, nobody wants to be the one person left out. And so it hides careerism because you can't tell the difference between someone lying because they're covering for their troops or it's a dumb requirement or they want to look good. We can't tell the difference. And so everyone who's just lying to look good, they're clumped in there also. But a deeper underlying problem of leaving things the way they are is that when we talk about the profession, when we have classes in ethics, and then when we have a culture like this, all we're doing is teaching hypocrisy. We learn very early in the career on how to talk the talk that people want to hear and how to act a different way. And I used to think this started right after you came into the Army until someone corrected me and they said, no, actually it started before I came in the Army. You see, they went to a recruiter, they went to the MEP station, and uh, they're filling out the paperwork. And uh, one of the questions on there says, have you ever smoked dope? And they write, yeah, OK, fine, I experimented once. They hand it to the MEPS person. And the MEPS person says, turns it around and says, you might want to think differently. And so the person goes, OK, he wants me to say, I never did. That's good. You're good. And they take it from there. He said, that from that point on, he learned that the Army wants us to be hypocrites. For me, it was back when as a brand new second lieutenant, they gather us all in a big auditorium. They have the doctors up front, and I was at the first army physical. And so they say, okay, block one on the form, fill out, write your last name. So we all, we all Wong, and then block two, first name. So we do that, and social security number. And then down block 12 is describe your physical condition. Block 12, write, I am an excellent physical condition. We all write, I am an excellent physical condition. <laughs> For an entire career, I wrote in block 12, I am in excellent physical condition. Because I thought that's what you're supposed to write. Because they don't, I never gave it any thought what it means. I just, until which physical do you think I said? My retirement physical. I said, I am not in perfect physical condition anymore, okay? <laughs> but for an entire career, I was content on just writing, I am in perfect physical condition, okay? Uh, they teach us to be hypocrites from the very beginning. And we teach our subordinates to be hypocrites. Really, we do. We say, just, no, that's not, you can't say that. You have to say this. Well, this is, if you really want the truth, 
No, I want you to say this, okay? So we teach ourselves. And for a profession to be hypocrites, it's pretty bad, okay? It's pretty bad. But there's another problem with leaving things the way they are. The status quo is unacceptable because we are a profession. And a profession, like Don pointed out, we're experts in something. What else? We earn society's trust, okay? But also, when there's a problem in a profession, what happens? You police yourselves. If we leave things the way they are, someone else will fix it. Now, am I being alarmist? Do you think someone would really jump in and say, well, because of this report, we'll solve your problems? Do you think someone would ever send me an email that says something like this? Hi, Lenny. I recently read an article about the burdens of mandatory training requirements faced by the military. As a current legislative staffer, I figured I could actually help provide a solution to the problem, at least for statutorily mandatory training. Are you ever in Washington? If not, could we schedule a time to talk on the phone? Also, do you have a list of all the unit's manual mandatory training requirements? I would love to see the entire list and possibly determine some courses of actions to eliminate some. Thanks a lot, your friend, legislative staffer. Would someone really send me that? Yes, they did, okay? When I got that one, I said, holy smokes. It's the worst fear for a profession. Because if we don't police ourselves, somebody else will. Somebody else will. And then we start walking down the path of, okay, forget this profession stuff. If we can't tell ourselves the truth, somebody else will take care of it. So this study came out a little over a year ago. Um, we posted it online. It wasn't ever a distributed hard copy, but I'm not stupid. And so before it got posted online, I sent it to the chief of staff of the Army's office. I sent it to the office of the public affairs uh, officer of the Army, and then the office of the chief of legislative liaison. And uh, what do you think they said when I sent them a copy of this? I've read and understand. What's that? I've read and understand. It's, it's, it, they got, we got nothing back. We got nothing back because... Who has time to read this? It's only 34 pages, but who has time to read it? And so they got it. Okay, so okay. And so we unveiled it on a Tuesday. And then uh, on, uh, well, actually, before I jump to that, we had three recommendations that came out of this uh, study. Three recommendations. The first one is acknowledge the problem. First, we have to admit that we live in a system that causes us to lie. We have to admit that we lie. Uh, that took about 20 minutes in focus groups to do. But there's one population that finds it's very, very hard to acknowledge this problem. What population do you think that is? Senior leaders. Now, why is it, would it be hard for a senior leader to admit that this happens? Because they not only drank the Kool-Aid, they made the Kool-Aid. I mean, really? OK. And so talk about a, a, a kick in the gut to say, you were successful in this system. And you lived in this system? OK. So senior leaders have a hard time listening to this. Why else do senior leaders have a hard time with this? They can't fix it. Ooh. Yeah, they can't fix it by themselves. OK. They can't fix it by themselves. Another reason is, is when a senior leader wants to go on leave, what do they do? They turn their head 15 degrees to their aide and say, put me on leave. OK. What about trips? No, that doesn't happen, OK? Um, so, so they are not caught up in the, the mire that we are caught up in, OK? What's that? Hypocrisy. Well, I wouldn't call it hypocrisy. It's just the way the Army is. It's just structured differently. I had a major in one audience. He stopped me and said, when you talk about bath salt training or human trafficking training, what are you talking about? And I said, holy smokes. This person's led a privileged life because that's been mandatory training for a long time. And every time they had mandatory training, what happened? Someone else signed for him. Someone else signed. I said, holy smokes, what a perfect example of, I mean, he doesn't know what I'm talking about. At least I can pretend I was there, OK? <laughs> and so, so acknowledge the problem. It's really hard for a senior leader to stand here and talk about it. Because they have to say, I caused you to lie, or I lied myself. That's really hard for a senior leader. It's easier for peers. It's easy for some civilian, but it's really hard for a senior leader to say, let's get a handle on this. So we have to acknowledge the problem. The next thing we have to do is exercise restraint. This is the Army uh, 
training and leader development, we call 350-1. It's a list of every single requirement. It just gets bigger and bigger. It's really hard to stop people. We have to somehow exercise restraint. What might that look like? Well, it might look like a constituent saying, you know, we got a problem across our society with uh, electronic cigarettes. I think you need some kind of uh, mandatory training in, uh, in the military. Well, maybe someone should say to them, you're right, we'll try to insert that in every four years, or you know, we'll ta have to look for something to take out, but right now we can't cover the dangers of vaping because we have Constitution Day in there right now. Um, so we need to somehow exercise restraint at all levels. It's not just at the department level. If you look at every single level, someone always wants to create requirements. Now, why do they want to create requirements? Is it because they're evil? No, they're well-meaning. There's no, see, we like to look for bad people doing this. Everyone is well-intentioned. They say, you know, we have a problem with this. And the way we could address that is mandatory training or this form or this. And so it's well-intentioned, but a cumulative effect, someone needs to exercise restraint. And finally, we need to lead truthfully. What does that mean? It means someone's got to tell the truth. Someone has to start telling the truth. So we start telling the truth to Congress, we start telling the truth upward, start telling the truth downward. Someone has to start telling the truth. At the Army War College, just like here, we have faculty that like to go to academic conferences. Now, academic conferences, uh, the GSA sort of ruined it for us by going to Las Vegas and having big parties. And so for us to go to academic conference, we had to turn in a permission slip to the J7. Uh, and so our provost, who's our second in command at the War College, um, would have to send an email to the J7 saying these two faculty members need to go to this uh, academic conference, but he'd have to ha say it's mission critical. And he said, but we just had a study come out that says we have to stop lying. And he says, I want to tell you, these people need to go to this conference because it's professionally rewarding, but it is not mission critical. The Army War College will continue on to survive if these people don't get to go, but they need to go. So I'm not going to lie to you and say it's mission critical, can they go to the academic conference? J7 writes back, I'm a retired Marine. We didn't have this problem in the Marines. That was the first statement. And then the second one was, is it mission critical? To which the provost responded, yeah, yeah it's mission critical. OK. They, he tried to lead truthfully. It won't always work. It won't always work. We're caught in this culture, OK? But someone has to push it. Or we could just. Let things roll on. We could just learn to be hypocrites, OK? So now I'll go on to what was the reaction? It was posted on a Tuesday. On Wednesday, Washington Post picks it up. Lying in the military is common, Army War College study says. CNN picks it up. US Army officers lie routinely, OK? Army Times, Army officers report to and defend their lying. They actually had a pretty good article that described the study pretty well. What's interesting about the Army Times is their picture. And uh, so, um, so, but I also started getting lots of cards and letters in. Now, I'm at the age now where my peers, a lot of my peers are just senior people in the Pentagon. And, uh, and so they're sending me emails, okay? And uh, you start to gauge the reaction by the emails that come in. And so here's an email that came in from a, uh, a friend who says, uh, Headquarters, Department of the Army, and the, the subject line is, uh, War College study published, researchers conclude that lying in the Army is common. And he writes back to me, he says, Lenny, really? And then he says, oh man, just how twisted is the media take on your research? Okay, now what does that, if I, that's all that was in the email, but that email is actually pretty revealing. What does it say about the senior leader take on the study? He didn't read it. He didn't read it. What did he read? He read the headlines. Okay, and so the first reaction I got from senior leaders was the headlines of someone trying to make a name for themselves by poking the army and just saying the army's full of liars. That's, that was his reaction, okay? That reaction continues on for anyone who hasn't read the study and just thinks, well, he's some guy just trying to make a name for himself by calling everyone in the army liars. Anyone, anyone could do that. It's another one of these disgruntled people who wishes we make another rank, but uh, okay. And so I'd, I'd go in front of general officers and I'd, we'd do a briefing 
or not really a briefing, more of a discussion on this topic, and I'd have comments like, well, uh, I got to question your methodology. And I'm like, what methodology? It was, I talked to people. I mean, it's not like I did anything scientifically like rigorous on this. And then, or, you know, this isn't really a good time for the study to come out. Well, when is a good time for a study to come out that says we lie to ourselves, okay? <laughs> um, and so, so that was the reaction I would get. A lot of anger, a lot of, you are attacking my profession. I am a steward of the profession as a senior leader, and you're putting down the profession. We don't air dirty laundry, okay? We don't air dirty laundry. And so that's what the reaction. But then I also saw the study being examined in places like this. This is doctrine man. People in the Army, I'm not sure if other services look at it, but it's, a, it's the offline forums, okay? And in the offline forum, I see, you see comments like this. In other news, water is wet. <laughs> okay. So what is this person saying? What is this person saying? He's saying, you pay this guy a salary to do this report? Are you kidding me? It's an open secret. Everyone knows this happens. So here, imagine I'm sitting at my desk getting emails saying, how could you? How dare you? And this saying, do you have a job? OK. Are you kidding me? So what I saw was, if you looked at, our, at the force, what I saw was, uh, really, I saw a split. And I saw the split happen right after 06 command. Who am I pointing this at? At the screen. She told me to point it that direction. OK. <laughs> You, you, wait till, you wait till slide 27 to tell me that? Okay. So I see a split. After 06 command, I saw a, a, one attitude this way, and, and everyone else has this attitude. And f for these guys, I saw, we live this. You didn't tell us anything new. We already knew that. On this hand, it's not so fast. Let's not, let's not be so quick to jump to conclusions. Let's study it. Let's keep looking at it. And so I saw anger and denial, but no kidding as the first phase of the reaction. The second phase of the reaction, I started seeing that the bureaucracy started responding. I could see little indications that, oh, they're actually listening, okay? And so one of the things that happens, I, I got an email uh, from Department of the Army G3 asking me, that study you did over a decade ago, how did you collect up all those requirements? And uh, could you show us your methodology there? I think they were thinking, where did he come up that 297 days? Did he just make it up? And I just happened to save in Excel all the lists of uh, requirements and how we came up with that. And I shipped that off to them, and I think it blew his mind because it was a giant file of things that I'm sure he was shocked that I saved over a decade ago. Um, but I also saw things like um, this email was sent to me by a major at Fort San Antonio who said, I think you might find this funny. And don't put my name on this email, though. And he says, uh, but he sends this. And he says, uh, you can see when it was sent, March 4th. And it's, here's the task. By Mar March 5th, identify mandatory training and non-training responsibility. That's, this is a direct quote out of the study. And this came from Department of the Army G3, an email. We got at the War College, too, saying, give me every single requirement we put on company commanders. I did a study, and it took me, I justified my salary for a year doing a study like that. <laughs> and how long do they want? A day. And the study just happens to say is if you give us a dumb requirement, what will we do? We'll lie to you. We'll lie right back to you. Okay, so this major who sent this email to me says, I think someone read your study, but they didn't understand it. Okay? <laughs> but I could see the bureaucracy was bending. Okay? I could see the bureaucracy bending. And then, more recently, about three weeks ago, the Army put out an executive order, 2-16, where they said, you know what, we're going to have to change things. You know all those mandatory requirements? We're going to make it so that a two-star can eliminate, in their command, a two-star can eliminate some requirements. Uh, and then they said, we're also going to try to protect company commanders and battalions a certain uh, date. And we're going to pull some requirements out of mandatory training and not make it mandatory training, but now put it under command responsibility. For example, human trafficking, you no longer have to train on it for an hour every year, but now you just have to be responsible for it. What do you think? <laughs> it's a start in the right direction. It's a start in the right direction. But when I brief this, I get a lot of people saying, you got to be kidding me. That's it? Or I had one 03 say, wait a minute, back when I briefed them, he said it's been six months since the study came out, and I haven't seen anything change. I haven't seen anything change. And so 
that's where phase three starts kicking in. As I see the bureaucracy bending, but phase three, people are starting to say, so where's, where's the big change? The study's been out over a year now. When you walk out those doors, it's still there. You're gonna have to make your subordinates lie to you. You're gonna have to lie upward. We still live in the same environment. So I gave this talk once and uh, I got a response back like this. After the talk, that, you know, I got, they sent me the feedback after the talk. And they said, one of the biggest problems with our army was presented to the senior leaders of the Corps, consider the conscience of the army. And then we thanked Dr. Wong and continued on our way without addressing the elephant in the room. What can we do to change a culture of self-deceit? See, I can talk all I want in here, but nothing has changed. And so you have a choice as soon as you walk out to say, so how do we live? Do we continue on with it because we're trapped? Do I try to make changes? Who makes the changes? Do the senior leaders do it? Or does the force do it? Well, what's the answer to that? It's both. What I'd really like to see is like a, a little mini rebellion of people saying, oh, we're gonna tell the truth. We're gonna tell the truth. What's, do you want me to lie to you? Okay, or commanders, before they go in to talk to the big commander, saying, okay, let's talk, tell the truth about this, this, and this. There's no way we can tell the truth about this, okay? <laughs> we'll lie to them about that, but all the others, why don't we all, why don't we all tell the truth, okay? That's the only way it's gotta be. So after the study came out, you could see the reaction, is that now we're into this. We continue to live with this. We continue to live in the environment that I just described. For upper, let us continue to work on it but these people are getting impatient. They're getting impatient. So I had to ask myself, so what is the genesis of all this? At first I blamed it on mandatory training. It's really not mandatory training that's the, that's the cause of all this. We like to blame the mandatory training. Where this really comes from is that back when I was younger and I, all I turned in was a Department of the Army Form 31, a leave request to go on leave, back in those days when a soldier didn't come back off of leave, we didn't go to his trips and say, well, he said he was supposed to stop in this place. Or when there's a suicide in the unit, we didn't say, did he sign the roster? Or if a person's killed in an MRAP rollover, we didn't say, did he get MRAP rollover training? We didn't go to the paperwork. We didn't go to this giant system we've created. Where did we go? Where did we go to say, hey, wait a minute, what happened here? We went to a leader. And so what we've done in the Army is that we've said, you know what, leaders are humans. And that scares me, because it's hard to trust someone who's imperfect. Back in the old days, if someone didn't come back off a of leave, we went to the leader and said, where is Smith? Did you check his flights? Did he have enough leave? Did you check his vehicle? But we don't like to live with that, because we know that's imperfect. And so instead of going to bed at night, wondering if the leader did their job, wondering if maybe he messed up on this one, we replaced the leader with a form with a checklist. And even though we know the checklist is a lie, we feel better about it. We know it's a lie, but it makes us sleep better at night because it's better than trusting a human. We need to get back where we put the burden on leaders. A lot of people say, well, personal responsibility. It's a, yeah, society needs personal responsibility, but in the military, we have this thing called leadership. We don't expect people to be responsible for themselves. We expect leaders to be responsible for people. We can't replace leadership with a system. We can't replace leadership with check marks. A leader is where it should fall, and that requires trust. We have to start building that trust back. So how much does Martin Cook pay me to come talk to you? He pays me nothing, so hopefully you got your money's worth. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>